shall I carry on? Um, so yeah. be, okay, yeah. right. Um, so having sort of set the scene for this event, uh, now intend to move towards our presentations. And I will be brief in my introductions because I like to do set, to set the scene, but we haven't really got time for that this morning as we're due to finish by 10 o'clock. Okay, uh, my, my fir first presentation we have, uh, South End Business Partnership is delighted to introduce to you the C Carbon Trust and it operates globally on a mission to accelerate the move to sustainable low carbon economies. And really pleased to welcome Tiffany Aries, who's client executive from Carbon Trust. So over to you, Tiffany, and I know you're sharing your presentations, yeah? Me know when you can see that it's coming up on my screen now yeah yeah I great see. perfect um yeah so good morning everyone thanks so much for joining the meeting this morning and thanks for the introduction as well murray um so uh, like murray said my name is tiffany aries i'm a client executive at the carbon trust um and i work on our business services uh, team so it's essentially the team that works with all of our corporate clients. We also have another part of our business that works with kind of governments and councils as well. Um, so this morning I'm gonna to talk to you, um, give you a brief introduction on the Carbon Trust and then talk to you a little bit about um, targets, um, specifically carbon neutral targets uh, and how you can achieve them as uh, a business. So um, like Murray mentioned, so the Carbon Trust is a mission driven organisation and our mission is to accelerate the move to a sustainable low carbon economy. Um, we've been operating since 2001 when we were originally um, set up by UK government uh, and we have been kind of, um, we have separated from the government and we kind of run uh, in a completely kind of self-sustaining way now um, since almost 2009, um, which is great. Um, we work all over the world and we have offices um, in the UK, in Amsterdam, in Singapore, in China, in Mexico. We've really, really expanded our reach um, since 2001 and it's one of the main things that's changed. Um, whereas we used to be just UK focused, now we're very kind of global and um, try and um, accelerate our mission um, around the world, um, which is also great news. Um, so, starting uh, on the actual content of this um, presentation, so what is carbon neutrality and how do I achieve it? Um, I'm sure that many of you would have seen, uh, especially over the past kind of uh, two years in 2019, 2020, kind of a real growth in the amount of companies that are um, publicly announcing uh, quite ambitious targets, um, whether those be carbon neutral targets, science based targets, um, net zero aligned targets, um, and it really is an area that's kind of growing. And we can see that there's lots and lots of di different businesses of different sizes that have um, pledged to being carbon neutral, um, some of them uh, by 2025, some of them out to 2050. Um, but it can be sometimes a little bit um, confusing and uh, understanding what the definitions are and, and what the differences are between these targets, I think is very important and, and how you can actually um, put steps uh, in place in your kind of sustainability roadmap and start on this journey in order to meet um, targets such as this one. Um, so what does carbon neutrality actually mean? So um, carbon neutrality is a term that's been defined by the international PAS 2060 standard. Um, and essentially what, what it represents is that you have to have measured um, a footprint, a carbon footprint, either for an organisation, a product or an event, um, that you have developed a carbon reduction roadmap that is forward looking. So um, establishing that the different steps that you're going to take over the next 12 months in order to reduce your emissions and that you are compensating for emissions that are currently being emitted by um, the entity. So either the business, the event um, or the product. Um, so there's different key steps um, that you need to obviously take in order to um, start your carbon neutral journey. So defining your boundary, um, developing your management plan and then having kind of an offsetting strategy. Um, so just to give you the, the difference between net zero and carbon neutral, as um, the, these have uh, been seen to be used inter interchangeably sometimes in the media, but they are actually quite different um, and they do have uh, they do represent different levels of ambitious ambition as well. 
Um, so if you see on the table here, so a net zero target, according to the kind of SBTI um, approved definition at the moment, although this isn't uh, a definition that's set in stone, I would say, um, includes setting yourself, uh, uh, well, the, the boundary would be for your scope one, two and three, um, and I'll go through these scopes in a moment, um, but essentially it will go through, it will include all of your direct emissions as well as all of your indirect emissions, um, so emissions within your supply chain, for example, um, you'll need to set yourself a 1.5 degree aligned science-based target trajectory. Um, so the science-based target um, trajectories are those that are aligned with the decarbonisation pathways um, that were defined during the Paris Agreement. Um, and that residual emissions should be compensated through greenhouse gas removals. Um, so greenhouse gas removals are quite different to offsets. Greenhouse gas removals require uh, a certain of amount of carbon to actually be removed from the atmosphere, whether that be through soil or through air capture, um, whereas offsets are a mechanism through which you are um, usually avoiding um, future emissions rather than actually removing carbon. Um, under the past 2060 definition for carbon neutrality, so this requires scope one and two emissions to be included. So these are your direct organisational emissions, um, which again, I'll go through in a moment. Um, and you are encouraged to include um, scope three emissions, your, your kind of um, indirect emissions from your supply chain, both up and downstream, but this isn't a requirement under the standard. So um, depending on your level of ambition, um, we'll kind of define whether you include those or not. Um, then, of course, you need to set yourself targets as part of the uh, reduction targets as a part of your commitment to being carbon neutral. Um, but these, uh, the, the level of ambition for these isn't defined like it is defined in the net zero scenario. Um, so we would tend to say that a carbon neutral um, target is sort of the start, the short term target that you might have um, with net zero being kind of the end goal. Um, so to just recap, so it can be achieved, uh, carbon neutrality can be achieved on an organisational product or event level. And there's kind of four main steps. So the carbon footprint measurement stage, the creation of your qualifying explanatory statement, which will include your carbon reduction roadmap, um, the purchasing of offsets to compensate for your emissions, and then set, if you um, want to be certified by a third party, um, which I think with carbon neutrality is uh, tends to be quite beneficial from kind of a reputational um, uh, benefit perspective, then that would be the last step. Um, so if I move on to the footprint measurement stage, so uh, I was just spoken about scope one and two emissions. So essentially your scope one and two emissions will be all your emissions that arise from your company facilities. Um, so that whether that be offices, manufacturing sites, retail sites, um, all emissions um, that arise from those. It will be all emissions relating to fuel combustion from your um, company fleets, so company vehicles, whether that be company cars, delivery vans, etc. Um, and then also any emissions that arise from your purchased electricity, heat or steam as a business. Um, so if you are procuring green energy, there's two different um, approaches for reporting on your carbon in your scope two. Uh, so you can either report on a location based approach, which essentially takes an average UK grid emission factor in order to calculate emissions um, that arise from your electricity procurement. Or you can use what we call a market based approach. And um, this approach will take into account um, your specific tariff that you're on. So um, it will really demonstrate the benefit that there is to having um, to procuring renewable energy or being on a greener tariff. Um, so it's important to kind of make sure that you are able to distinguish both of those when you um, complete your footprint management. And it is a, a great way of, of reducing your operational emissions as well. Um, you can choose to also include scope three within your um, your carbon neutral um, uh, ambition. So here you'll see on those two kind of grey arrows that have just appeared, um, the 15 different categories that are included within scope three um, that include both upstream and downstream impacts. Um, so some of these obviously will be um, more, um, well, not, not all of these categories will be relevant to every business, firstly. Um, and secondly, some of these categories um, will be extremely material and others will 
um, be kind of de minimis. So not many companies will include all scope three emissions within a, a carbon neutral um, ambition. Uh, I would say some of these categories you will also have more control over as a business. So business travel, for example, is one of the categories that is often picked um, as a part of this type of certification, um, just because it is something that um, the business kind of can uh, influence um, through policies and, and behaviour change and things like that. Um, obviously, with COVID this year, um, business travel has significantly reduced. So I'm sure for, for all those businesses that did have business travel reduction targets, hopefully those have been met. <laughs> Um, so once you have completed, um, well, once you've set your boundary and then um, uh, understand uh, what your footprint is, both from a scope one, two and any um, optional scope three emissions, you can then move on to your qualifying explanatory statements. So essentially, um, this is a document that should be externally available. Um, so I think PASS 2060 really requires a level of transparency, um, which, which is really important in this case, um, and includes four main sections. So some general information about your business, um, a declaration of commitment. So this is your business committing to being carbon neutral for a specific period of time. And then once you do um, meet uh, your, your uh, following um, your first year once you've kind of been carbon neutral for a year and um, re reduced your emissions in that 12 month period you would also have a declaration of achievement upon which you would be able to say um, that over the last 12 months you have achieved a certain percentage of, of emissions reductions. Um, you'd also need to include a footprint breakdown, so um, demonstrating an understanding of where your hotspots are within your operations and within any scope three emissions that you've included um, is really important. And this should also guide um, the next step, which is the, car the development of the carbon management plan as well. In terms of the carbon management plan, so the carbon management plan is going to be kind of the most um, involved part of, of the qualifying explanatory statement from most businesses. Um, it, it's the part where um, you will need to kind of define targets um, uh, in terms of what you want to achieve as a business, um, both in terms of timescales, but in terms also of, of ambition. Um, the plan means for achieving those targets and for maintaining reductions over time. Um, and this may include kind of any assumptions that you're making, um, any kind of techniques and measures um, that you are, are planning to, to implement. Um, any technology that you're planning on um, investing in, uh, kind of what you plan on doing as a business maybe in the next 12 months and then what you see as longer term goals for the business in order to, to reduce emissions going forward. Um, these can be shown on an absolute basis but it can also be shown on a um, relative intensity basis as well. Um, so if you chose um, turnover, for example, as your relative uh, benchmark, then you could basically de demonstrate that the carbon intensity um, of, of your product or service or, or organisation is going down um, despite having um, higher revenues over time. You will also need to kind of define your um, offsetting strategy. So this includes the planned types of offsets that you're going to purchase, the projects and schemes that you plan on supporting. Um, and also, if, if this is kind of a second time round, uh, so if you're recertifying after your first year, you'll also need to talk a little bit about your, your previously um, purchased offsets as well. Um, so in, in terms of your offsetting strategy, so we always recommend that you um, uh, include have some kind of employee engagement within this exercise. So trying to understand what if there isn't a um, directly obvious link between uh, the, the projects and offsets that you're purchasing and your, your business and what your business does, and then involving um, other stakeholders, both internally and externally, to understand um, what your employees and what your customers care about can be a really good way of engaging um, and ensuring that your offset strategy really tells a story and, and aligns with what your business stands for. Um, there are different um, quality offsets, um, which uh, you should be mindful of. So um, as the Carbon Trust, we accept um, three different kinds of offsets, um, gold standard, VCS and woodland carbon code. 
Um, there are other offsets out there, um, but those are the ones that we would kind of recommend um, as the, the kind of most credible um, and, and high quality offsets out there. Um, so I have spoken a little bit about offsets already, but um, offsetting is essentially a mechanism for compensating for emissions. Um, so for emissions that cannot be um, reduced right now or that cannot um, be eliminated right now, you can use this mechanism in order to, to demonstrate your willingness to compensate for those. Um, the idea is essentially that you would have a baseline. So in your first year of, of um, committing to being carbon neutral, you would calculate your footprint and then purchase your offsets that would be equivalent to that same amount of footprint and that in the following year your offset purchase would be lower than your original baseline because your footprint would have reduced during that time. So your um, reliance on offsets should decrease over time until eventually um, your, your emissions are zero. Obviously depending on the sector that your business is in, this is um, can be easier said than done. Um, but I think for certain um, office-based businesses, for example, um, having um, emissions of zero or almost zero is, is very um, possible in the next kind of five years. Um, in terms of certification, so certification isn't um, a kind of obligatory, but it is something that is recommended as um, I think uh, with with such a standard where there can be some uh, sort of pushback and there can be criticism from stakeholders in terms of the um, credibility and robustness of carbon neutrality, um, it, I think it is really important to have kind of third party assurance um, just to demonstrate that your business actually has followed the rigour of the standard and um, that you are actually planning to reduce your emissions um, going forward and that it's not just an exercise of you know buying um, offsets and not actually trying to change anything internally um, which it can be seen as that way um, if not done correctly. Um, so there are obviously a lot of benefits to certification. Um, obviously, it, we the Carbon Trust um, do provide this service, but it is kind of we do provide internationally recognised logos that can help you to communicate those. Um, we uh, obviously follow very rigorous standards in terms of our assurance processes, um, and um, the Carbon Trust did co-author um, part of the Past 2060 standard, so we are very familiar with it. Um, we also do get quite a lot of inquiries around such targets, so um, our press office is very good at kind of managing those um, uh, requests and answering questions from um, external parties, so that can be quite a good benefit of that. Um, and then finally, just to showcase um, one of our clients that became carbon neutral this year. So Freddie's Flowers um, is an SME mainly based uh, in London, but also um, delivers outside of London as well. Um, and essentially um, becoming kind of carbon neutral certified has been the gateway to starting on their sustainability journey um, and has really helped them to um, kind of become a more transparent business in terms of what they their ambitions are from a sustainability perspective, um, but also understanding what their hotspots were within their own operations and how they could um, reduce their emissions going forward. Um, and they are looking to implement some great initiatives such as um, having, you know, 75% of their deliveries um, through um, uh, electric vehicles or through um, their kind of bicycle delivery service that they provide um, and are also planning on moving to a fully um, renewable tariff as well and um, so they've really um, managed to unlock quite a lot of um, not only reputational benefit um, but also a lot of carbon and cost savings throughout this this process um, you can also find lots of other um, testimonials and um, uh, client examples on our website as well um, but I just thought I'd leave you with that um, flavor for for um, my last slide um, if you do have any questions then obviously I would be happy to answer them at the end back over to you Murray excellent Tiffany thank you ever so much for that uh, review and walk through it um, and with the slides, it was very helpful and informative. Um, I'll, before I hand on, I'll just say there is a question online on the chat from Sam. So if you could look at the, that and maybe we'll, hopefully we'll find time at the end to, re, to respond to that. Okay, um, I'm now delighted to move on to our next speaker and that's you know from the private sector, a really 
highly regarded um, local company, IPCO, that trades internationally. And uh, a warm welcome to you, Steve McKinley, Vice President Manufacturing. Over to you. Good morning. Morning, everyone. Uh, thanks for the introduction, Murray. Um, I'm just going to share my screen. Hopefully you can all see that. OK, um, yes, good morning. Um, as Murray said, my name is Steve McKinley. I'm Vice President of uh, IPCO Manufacturing. Um, I've been asked to provide um, an overview of a new facility that um, we are having built. It's, uh, it's still in the final stages of fit out. Um, so what I'm going to show you guys is um, uh, uh, some pictures and some uh, a video and then some key points and go through some of the things that we considered as a business um, when we decided to build this new facility. So just a very top level view of um, of IPCO. Um, for those of you that are not aware of us, we are uh, based in South End on Sea. Um, we um, essentially design and manufacture um, uh, aerospace products. Um, most people will know us for the uh, uh, delivering uh, a product to Boeing aircraft. Um, so we are um, standard fit across pretty much all Boeing um, airplanes. Um, we actually have, as it says there, we do actually have a growing presence in the galley sector. Um, so we do actually manufacture um, microwaves, ovens, et cetera, et cetera. So we are, um, as a family business, we are uh, a relatively large employer. We employ um, about 700 people um, and we do have facilities um, all over the world. Uh, a head office is actually based in South End on Sea and um, our, uh, our, our owner, uh, Steve Johnson, is um, is the third generation. Um, and I'll probably go on to talk about, you know, some of the, the benefits of, of being family owned and the, the amount of red tape that we don't have to go through. We are and have always been uh, a pioneering company. We're not scared to lead from the front and do things that perhaps people haven't done before. Um, so myself, um, like many others, I started as an apprentice with the business um, 36 years ago um, and been quite fortunate to see see the business grow over over many years and um, it, it, you know had the opportunity to work in in you know various um, facets of the business and, and seen it from from pretty much the shop floor as an apprentice right through to to my current position. Um, so. It probably started, um, I would say, um, probably about 14 years ago, we we um, started looking at um, the possibility of building a uh, an additional facility um, in South End. Um, and we took the decision um, that uh, we would build a new manufacturing facility to consolidate our operations. Um, as you appreciate, you know, we we have grown and became a bit fragmented and we have um, two machine shops that uh, produce components uh, for the products that we assemble and deliver. Um, so um, we um, commenced that build of the facility um, in June um, of last year and the base build was completed um, last month, uh, July, yeah, just over a month ago. Um, and we are just actually going through the fit out stages of the machine hole. Um, so as it says there, um, the, we've got a number of people working in the, the machine shop um, and we expect that element of the build to complete in November. Um, we do have um, a, a number of other activities to take place, but uh, I guess from start to finish, we expect that we will be fully operational um, by April 2021. So you know, a few months to go yet. Um, so hopefully you can all see that. Um, that's a picture of the actual facility. Um, I say it is in South End on Sea. Um, it is um, we we purchased a 6.8 acre plot um, within the new South End business park. We are the first people to to occupy the business park, um, and just 
moving on. So we have just behind there, I don't know if you can see um, on the next slide, um, we do have a number of facilities in the background um, that we will be vacating, um, I guess, at some point in the future. So there's an aerial shot of the building. It's 133,000 square feet. Um, you may notice that um, there are a number of um, uh, PV panels on the roof, um, and I'll, I'll go on to talk about how we came to the decision to incorporate those. Um, and just another view of the facility from the rear, um, probably a better view as you can see there from uh, of, the, of the PV panels and outbuildings, etc. Um, okay, so I'm just going to I'm going to try and if this if this works, um, talk you through. This is a little video. I uh, appreciate some of you may be familiar with IPCA, some not. So um, thought it'd be useful to maybe show this video. Hopefully that's working. Um, and it just shows you the key elements of the facility. Um, so we're just entering into the reception. Um, and there's there's lots of there were lots and lots of changes to this facility from when we first signed up to it to what we've got today. Um, so this particular area is called the hub. Um, it's a, it's an area for all employees uh, to congregate. There's a cafe, um, there's a canteen, um, communal space. So this is a, a form. So we 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 included lots of different features into this facility that we don't currently have today. Um, some of them probably are standard in lots of other facilities. So this is the office space. Um, we got things like T points and print rooms. You've probably noticed it's it's uh, it's actually where I'm sitting and uh, right at this point in time. Um, so uh, you know large building. Um, I think some of the information I gave other employees, the, the building is actually about 40 metres longer than the pitch at Wembley. Um, so it give you an idea of the, the size of the build. Um, and then this is this is the important bit. This is the machine hole. Um, what you're looking at there are um, uh, renderings of our actual machine tools um, so that we could position them correctly. Um, so these machine tools make a, a range of parts. Um, we're probably quite unique as a company in, in when we say we manufacture, design and manufacture the product, we actually do exactly that. We, we There's probably, you know, the majority, 85% plus of what we um, sell as the final product is actually uh, manufactured by us in South End. Um, what you're looking at there is a large treatments facility um, on the left, big grey structure that's actually been installed, it commenced this week. And I'll go on to talk about what that does and you know the environmental impact and how we've addressed some of those um, some of those concerns. So I kind of guess you know the um, for me as, as I mentioned my background is actually um, you know uh, as an apprentice and um, general manager and, and other roles I've held within the business is actually manif uh, is actually managing the, the manufacturing operations. Um, so when I was asked to oversee the the um, this facility, um, there was you know a number of things that that were considered, and I think the key ones for me. Um, Having having seen how we operate was to make sure that we engaged all employees. So a, a, a steering committee was formed, it include our owner, our CEO, and then you know other representatives from key areas within the business. Um, and you know what what you'll notice through these key points, um, it really it, it kind of broke into two or three key elements. It really about people. Um, and and then operations and, and environmental, you know, how we can improve. Um, so for us, um, you know, we our owner decided that that whatever we create in this facility, um, all of the facilities would be identical for everyone. Um, so although the front of house was very highly spec, we did exactly the same for the machine hole, um, and we engaged employees um, so that um, so we got their feedback. Um, sticking on um, sort of the, kind of the operational side, um, you may have noticed the surface treatments plant. Um, 
some of you won't be familiar with what that does, but um, untechnically, when we produce aluminium components, we have to protect them from the elements and stop any corrosion. Um, as you probably appreciate, um, you know, chemicals um, just by their nature uh, tend to be, you know, not very nice. And we we looked very hard at trying to eliminate some of the chemicals we currently use. Um, and I think what became apparent is that you get sort of kind of I, I kind of uh, snow blind. You just do what you've always done. Um, and I personally asked questions of employees. Why were we using certain chemicals? Um, and um, it's kind of long story short, it became apparent that actually there were better ways of doing things. So not only have we introduced new equipment, the the equipment which would have ordinarily catered for um, for chemicals such as you know um, allochrome and bondurite etc we've been actually able to eliminate that which is of course better for for people and better for for the environment um, and for, for me you know that's a massive improvement on what we've got um, but it was a bit of a challenge we've done a number of trials and tests um, and I think the key point there as well is that that there is some legislation coming in that is going to ban some of the chemicals that we're using, but we're kind of leading from the front. We're getting in first. We're speaking to our customers and advising our customers. We are offering a, an alternative. Um, the, um, as I mentioned, um, employee engagement. Um, I personally gave um, presentations to all employees in South End, I think it's about 600 of us, um, on a number of occasions, I think four occasions, and took all the feedback. And, um, you know, obviously you can't incorporate everything, um, but it was very positive, the feedback. There were lots of comments about, you know, the, uh, our environmental um, uh, you know, conditions and, you know, what we could do to improve. Um, you see, I've just put a small bullet point in there, you know, things that, that you know, we don't currently do, you know, we've, we've got a picnic area and we've got Wi-Fi. We're, we're encouraging employees to work, uh, to work differently, quite a bit differently to what we do today. Um, champion workshops focusing on noise, you know, how we eliminate noise, you know, manual handling, you know, the use of compressed air, um, you know, the movement of raw material. Um, so there were a number of groups and they were given the challenge of looking at how we, you know, either, you know, best case scenario, eliminate, you know, some of those issues um, or, or reduce them. Um, so we have, you know, looked at lo looking at using um, automatic goods vehicles um, and you know um, we have actually purchased um, conveyors that, that moves the kind of waste material rather than people physically having to man, uh, manually handle some of these uh, these uh, items. Um, so getting more onto the kind of green side, um, I'm certainly not an expert, um, but um, we did recognise right at the beginning that you know we we are a company as you saw um, from the from the video. Um, you know there are lots of machine tools on the shop floor. Um, we do use a lot of power. Um, we have bought machine tools which are much more efficient than they were certainly when I worked on the shop floor. Um, but we decided to install um, some photovoltaic panels, um, and we actually. Um, covered the roof you may have noticed the roof is curvy um, we've covered all of the roof on the uh, south side of both curves as much as we can there's approximately just over 1800 panels which will produce we believe approximately 30 uh, percent of all of our uh, energy requirement um, which is a uh, you know is obviously it's, it's good for for ipco it's also good for the environment and i guess morally it's the right thing to do so we didn't have any funding for that we did that ourselves as i said one of the one of the benefits working for a, a privately owned company and working directly for the owner is that you know we can make decisions rather quickly and just get on with it and that's what we've done with this building um, we did look at other ways of of becoming you know more carbon neutral um, with wind turbines and as it says there rainwater harvesting and you know our use of water um, so things that we have introduced that none of some of them are not um, you know, rocket science, but you know, we don't currently have 
um, changing rooms, for example, in our current facilities um, or sh the, the ability to shower. But if we're going to encourage people to, to cycle to work, I guess we ought to really provide them the facility to have a shower, etc. So we have a number of showers um, and it says there are 100 cycle spaces. Um, this particular bullet point um, has been uh, very difficult. We've looked at um, heat and ventilation and cooling systems. And um, the one thing that this new facility gives us over all of our other facilities is it's so thermally efficient. So not only does it keep the heat in, it also keeps the heat out. Um, and as part of my project, um, I visited um, numerous new builds all over the country um, and we have um, we have decided that um, that um, we believe that the heat gain from the machine tools themselves will um, will be efficient enough not to have any additional um, heating within the facility and we're also uh, recirculating the hot air from outbuildings compressors and outbuildings in the colder months um, Roof lights, um, you know, 10% of the roof space does actually have um, uh, roof lights. Um, it's on a day like today, it's very bright. Obviously, um, there's no there's no need to to turn the lights on if we can benefit from our you know from um, from natural daylight. Um, so yeah, the 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 install was going on at the moment. Once they're installed. All lights within this facility are all LED. That's pretty standard these days. They're all operated by PIRs. There's very few light switches in this facility. So if people, we're not relying on people turning things out or forgetting, um, and they're all connected to daylight sensors. So if it's bright enough, they don't come on at all. Um, the, uh, this particular bullet point, obviously, um, it still, um, revolves around the thermal efficiency of the building. Um, our other machine shops, um, they um, they get very, very hot um, in the summer months. You know, recently we had a spell where it reached over 30 degrees and the, they they get up to 44 degrees plus um, in, in those weeks, which is just unbearable. Um, we actually have put a number of temperature sensors all around at this facility internally and externally. And we've already recognized that it's at least, I think in most cases, about 12 degrees cooler inside and it is outside. So it's, it's more or less exactly the opposite to our current facilities. So for us, that's a massive uh, benefit to having uh, a new build, which is thermally efficient. Um, other things, um, you know, hot, we have an, a, a number of hot drinks vending machines. We've actually, due to COVID, stopped people using them um, because of all the touch points. Uh, the new facility, we're not planning on putting any uh, hot drinks vending machines in. What we do have are things called Billy Taps, which produce, um, you know, instant hot water and chilled water. I'm sure most of you have seen them. I think the the, the key point here is, is it does mean that we, you know, can, we can eliminate the the use of, you know, a, a fair few thousand uh, single use plastic cups. Um, and th these are the things that came out of some of the the feedback from the presentations from employees. You know how we can improve. Um, water consumption has been greatly reduced, um, pretty standard on new builds. Um, we've got obviously sensors um, and all the sanitary wear. Um, it might sound a minor thing, but you know, in some of our facilities, you know, we have water running through urinals, you know, day, night, weekends. Um, and, uh, you know, I don't know the exact figure, but I'm sure there's a fair few thousand gallons that go through them unnecessarily every year. Um, I probably could um, talk about lots of other things that, that we've done, but um, you know we, um, you know, there's there's a number of other um, elements to the business. You know, we do have electric vehicles to transport goods, and we do have um, massive kettles that boil off water from the soluble oil, so that we're not transporting lots of waste. Um, but I think, as I said at the beginning, um, for for me, um, you know, we're not. Um, we're not experts on green, but we have certainly introduced um, a lot of elements into this new build. And um, I guess time will tell whether we've got it right. And that's um, that's it from me, guys. Thanks for listening. Thank you ever so much, Steve. Uh, hopefully uh, everybody can hear me again. 
Um, that's really, really impressive. And it just shows you what can be done by private sector businesses. And uh, congratulations. And it's a very interesting process that you've outlined as to how you've gone about this. I think there's been one or two questions on chat, which can pick up later, although I think Caroline has sort of responded. But Steve, if you just have a look at those, then it'd be uh, good. But thank you, Steve. Yeah, of course. Appreciate it. Yeah. OK, uh, now on to our third speaker organisation, that's Clean Growth UK, uh, linking very much to supporting innovation. And I'm welcoming here Ian Tro, who's their strategic advisor. Ian, over to you. OK, so uh, good morning, everyone. I hope, uh, hopefully I've switched in. Uh, I'm just going to do the same as everybody else and uh, share my screen. So uh, well, just whilst I fiddle around here and get my act together, hopefully uh, that's all come up uh, for you now. And I'll just go into presentation mode. And uh, really, I suppose what I'm, what I'm going to try and do here is I'm going to give you a whistle top tour uh, around what is Clean Growth uh, UK. Uh, what is it all about? who does what, how does it work, what is the content and the approach, and what is different about it, what is our value add, what is the business impact, and what is the relevance to the audience today, which is predominantly SMEs. Now, what I would just build on the back of Steve's excellent presentation there is everything that we heard from Steve there is best practice. It's what businesses need to be doing. And our goal and our mission within Clean Growth UK is to bring that best practice to the table of SMEs, large like Steve's, but also small, like, for example, the uh, example from Tiffany with the florist, for example. So we have to spread, we have to cover the entire uh, gamut of business types in our in our mission here. So let's just uh, crack on a little bit and sort of explain uh, what all of this is about and who's doing what. So first of all, Clean Growth UK is a national uh, initiative. It is what it says on the tin. It's all about facilitating clean growth. It's all about productivity for the low carbon economy. And it's driven out of three primary university hubs. Uh, here you see it. Uh, 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 University of Brighton, University of Portsmouth, and up here in the north, and by the way, I'm sitting uh, from my home office in uh, Cheshire, uh, Liverpool John Moores University. And, uh, you know, you can sort of see the key words there in terms of, well, what are those generic uh, uh, mission, if you like, uh, points that we're trying to, trying to sort of uh, allude to, trying to offer insight to. And uh, in terms of how it all works and how it all uh, links to, let's call it the regional organization. So here we are uh, hosted by South and uh, uh, team, but also the whole low case LEP environment at a regional level. We cover this across the various aspects of the country. Okay, so, so that's how we interrelate with the local regional organisations. Uh, who are we? Okay, so first of all, uh, you know, I'm wearing a couple of hats here, but my, my day job, if you like, is we are consultant engineers. Okay, and uh, Quad Plus is an international business uh, in energy and automation technologies. These are the kinds of technologies that we do, which uh, uh, Steve will recognize from his machine tool uh, manufacturing plant. And we engage in the industrial sector in terms of uh, uh, process lines and large manufacturing and so forth. And this is one of our factories around the world in Turkey. And uh, I suppose the takeout from all of this and, and what my role in all of this is I look after uh, UK and Northwest Europe uh, activities for Quad Plus, and Quad Plus is a US-based business. But I suppose uh, the takeout here is that we are a private sector business. We are project managers. We execute change in businesses, large and small, at an engineering level. And we are service providers to Clean Growth UK to run this series of programmes. OK, so that's a little bit about us. Um, if we get back, step back to actually the point of all of this, which is innovation 
and it's clean growth innovation. You've got a top level strap line there from a corporate business, which actually says the potential for us all is huge. Potential not only to make a difference to our bottom line in terms of our businesses, in terms of productivity gain and cost reductions and so forth, but the potential is to actually help solve some of our big challenges as a society and a community, both in terms of environmental, but also social. So that's the top level uh, CSR corporate uh, viewpoint. But let's drop down a little bit and say, well, what is innovation? And I used to, I, I, if I had a corporate career, I'd work for people like DuPont and Fuji and Siemens. And if I uh, spoke to a Siemens uh, engineer in Germany and asked him what was innovation, he would say, ah, it's R&D, it's, it's technique, it's, uh, it's um, uh, pushing the boundaries of physics, it's material science, it's all of that clever stuff. But actually, innovation is far more fundamental than that. Uh, there's some words there about it, but fundamentally what innovation is doing today better what you did yesterday. It's as simple as that. And so it mixes between technical and process and best practice and continuous improvement. And it depends how you how you sort of use the words. But fundamentally, what we're trying to say with clean growth innovation is we can look at it from a product development point of view, a process improvement point of view, but also a business model or a service model point of view. OK, so that's our mission in, in the whole clean growth uh, uh, spread, if you like. And if you're smart about it, you can link productivity gain, uh, improvements on your bottom line, your P&L, your increase in installed capacity, your growth as a business, with actually doing the right things uh, for the environment, for sustainability, but also, as Steve mentioned there, in terms of employee morale and driving a new uh, ethos and values and culture across your businesses, both large and small. So how do we do it differently in the program? Well, we'll go into that a little bit, but fundamentally, we recognize that we're talking to SMEs. We recognize that time is short and time is valuable. So what we try and do is we try and start strategically by actually exploring what is possible, what is best practice, what are some of those things that, that Steve has alluded to in terms of what he has done? How do we do that? And how and what are the implications of it? And then what we do is we work with the cohort that are with us, and every cohort is different. And we get to know that uh, cohort. And I'm just uh, seeing that someone else is uh, sharing the screen, uh, which is a, a bit of... A bit, uh, uh, disappointing. So Murray, I don't know who's uh, uh, jumped in and shared their uh, uh, outlook there. Murray, you're you're muted. Yeah, I'm just trying to. Uh, sorry, Murray, that's actually me. So I'm just um, closing that. I'm sorry, I don't know quite okay. how that happened. I must. No, I, something. I, do apologize. I, okay. I, I recognize email, but I thought that's not my screen. <laughs> there you Sorry. go. So what I'm going to do is uh, I'm going to uh, jump back to my control of the share. So there we go. We've got overcome the, uh, the technical glitch there. Um, and basically what I was just trying to say is we, we break this down into chunks and with the goal that everybody on the on the course or the program gets a clear takeaway to make a business impact project for their own right. That is our goal in this. This is our mission. OK, so how do we do that? Well, what we do is we break the program into phases. Our first phase is where we throw a whole load of ideas up in the air and we explore what is possible. And during that first phase of workshops, uh, we and begin to understand who is in the room. We understand whether they're florists, we understand whether they're manufacturers, we understand whether they're a uh, supply chain or a service business or a startup or whatever. And we understand what floats the boat of that particular cohort. And uh, what we then do is in the second 
uh, phase of workshops, we deep dive what is appropriate for those people in the room. So we're tailoring, we're funneling the program to be very specific for the cohort, for the attendees in the room, with the goal that they can, at the end of the program, they take away something that they can do something with. And they are enlightened enough and they have enough engineering knowledge or insight to be able to know what they've got to do next. That is our goal. And under here, what we do is we create a, uh, a platform using Microsoft Teams where all the information and all the video streams and all the training content and all the interaction with us as consultant engineers are put together in a package where the attendees can pull that off uh, of, uh, for their own use. So that's how we do it. So the key thing there is a phased approach with bespoke content focused on the SMA. Okay, so what are the key themes? The key themes that always cut across all businesses are energy, automation of whatever it is they do, and the processes that bind all of that together. And those are those three key themes come up and again and again in what we do. And what is interesting is it doesn't matter whether you are a startup business or an established manufacturing business or whether you've got a greenfield opportunity like uh, Steve has mentioned, or whether you're retrofitting into a brownfield side. All of those th those core themes come up in every walk of life. And if we think about the sectors that we talk about, well, it's all the sectors. So we work with manufacturing, we work with facilities management, startup service businesses, lean in the office, retail, all of those normal sets of, of uh, broad SME base is uh, we're targeting in this program and we adapt the program to the core cohort to the SMEs okay so what else well the key thing with these key 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 messages here is everything is scalable and we can adjust it to uh, suit the need. The first thing to say is selected, you know, every every business has a value stream, has a process, but we're not here to try and 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 run a course on MBA course for, for operational excellence. That's not what we're here for. We're saying what are the key processes and let's have the, the perspective right for the SME to, to focus on. And what that can break down into is if you like with upstream energy it could be the solar panels that steve alluded to it could be about generating some wind power it could be about gathering data to know what your demand uh for your resource is it could be tips and tricks about applying some technology to minimize your energy use on the automation side manufacturing wise steve alluded to it he's got compressors you know there are certain things that you can do with compressor technology to make them more efficient. Uh, refrigeration, but it also could be a single outlet pipe from a, a small business. It doesn't have to be a multinational uh, manufacturing site to be able to apply some of this energy uh, knowledge, if you like. Um, it could be small uh, machinery, it could be a potter's wheel, it could be um, a clean room. So all of these things are scalable from what we're trying to, to, to share in terms of best practice. And uh, you can then extend that to the whole sustainability uh, cause in terms of, well, what is the circular economy? How do I recycle? What is my EV electric vehicle strategy going forward? And do I need to know a little bit more of the technicalities around that in terms of what the implications are of that? And that's what we as consultant engineers try and bring on the table. What I would say at this point is we're not trying to sell anybody anything. We're not installers. We don't install and sell solar PV. If somebody has an interest around what can that technology do for my business, then we will give an honest opinion, technically and engineering wise, about the pros and cons of it. We're not trying to sell anything to anyone. So that's some of the technology. Now, in terms of the approach that we have, you know, we used to do uh, 
two days worth of workshops where we got the cohort together and we would we would have breakout groups in that in that cohort and we would get together and we'd have flip charts and and work uh, work themes and uh, and ideas up we still do that we've gone virtual like the rest of the world and so in our uh, workshops that I mentioned earlier, you know, we will have breakout groups. We will get the cohort talking to each other. We will provide a, a, a platform for innovation and, and ideas with some technical guidance from ourselves. And so we always have this, this view about upstream energy and natural energy intelligently used. To do that, you've got to have some data. You've got to understand your processes. So perhaps one of the strap lines that we try and bring to the table is all about digital transformation. It's all about understanding your processes and how can you blend all of that stuff together to uh, create long term sustainable operations. So that's where we where we get into with all of this. Now, what are some of the outcomes of this, a typical outcome from some of this? Well, a good example is we try and apply simple, straightforward daily analogies to all, all aspects of the of the technology. So, for example, with upstream energy. We can put, apply the analogy of have you got a leaky bucket, which we really mean is if you take the water analogy, we all know about uh, the water utilities and, and they pump a load of water into the pipe network and they get a load of leaks out. And of course, that's waste, that's waste in terms of resources and CO2 footprint and also cost. So if you can stop the leaks, then actually you're making a productivity gain, but you're also making a CO2 carbon footprint reduction so, and you can apply that analogy to your grid connection believe it or not because depending on the circumstances and we explore this technically um, you can be creating losses in in your uh, supply chain you can be incurring uh, inefficiency losses due to lack of power factor correction, for example, or inductive loads and stuff, and all this techie stuff, which we explore in bite-sized chunks with everybody in the room when it's appropriate. So let me give you a couple of examples that have actually come out of the, these kinds of workshops. So easy to win success stories. Manufacturing, Steve will recognize this, without power factor correction, you know, you are creating losses in your your uh, supply chain into in your grid connection. So by taking some simple steps, you can actually create savings of £43,000 in this particular example of a manufacturer without the right technology in place, without the right insight and knowledge about what is possible. You can actually have bottom line improvements to your business cost savings but also you save tons thousands of tons of co2 per annum and the payback and this is the important but the payback is is less than a year as that example a second example could be hotels or, or hospitality similar situation by taking the right approach you can get an 11 10 11 percent savings on your electricity bills with uh, consequent savings in CO2 footprint and payback is still in a couple of years time. It, why wouldn't you do it? Same thing with care and health sector, same with logistics in terms of refrigeration, same with perhaps a bad example with Fa Frankie and Benny's, but let's call it restaurants anyway, in terms of looking at the where you use your energy resources. So I just gave one little snip snapshot of electricity savings in terms of some case studies of winds that have come out of the program that we've been running for the last two or three years. So that was a, a little bit of an example around the techie stuff. Okay. And we also go down the, the automation side, both in the office, but also in manufacturing and the whole digitization story. But in the program, we also step back a little bit and we are, and we talk about some strategic themes, a bit like what, what Tiffany was mentioning earlier. We talk a little bit about, well, what are the UN's sustainable development goals? And most importantly, how do I, as an SME, fit in with this? Do I fit in in responsible con consumption and production? Or do I fit in around, I don't know, uh, sustainable cities or do I fit in in uh, affordable clean energy we explore that a little bit and if in the cohort people want to 
explore that more, then we'll deep dive it uh, in the second phase of workshops. A bit more of the same, really, in terms of we explore what is a climate emergency? What is the circular economy? What is carbon neutral? Exactly what Tiffany was, was mentioning there. But we use case studies and real life examples on how to apply that knowledge. So this guy is Dale Vince from Ecotricity. About 18 months ago, he declared that he was going to drive his business to be carbon neutral within 18 months. And by the way, he's achieved it. And so he is a success story. So, you know, he's a largish SME, but we can take best practice learning from that example. And we try and share case studies like this. What else is going on? You know, you can actually sort of say, well, OK, that's all very interesting. This top level, you know, what is a climate emergency and what is uh, the UN stuff? But me on the ground in terms of an SME, what's going green for me? Well, that's usually uh, an environmental management system of some kind or other, either knowing about it, trying to develop one or 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 doing a, a tick box exercise to be able to uh, justify that you're green in terms of any tenders that you're trying to go after. So you can have a technical definition from British standards and you can sort of uh, go through all of that. But what we like to try and do is, is bring it up a level and sort of make it a, a mix between a bit ph philosophical, but also real tips and tricks in, ter in terms of how to execute uh, a strategy like that. And so we explore that a little bit. And of course, I've given you time now to think about what would Albert Einstein say? What is the environment? What would his answer be? And it's quite a profound answer. Actually. Now, I've given you the sort of time to think about that. And actually, his answer was that, which is quite uh, philosophical as well. And so we try and wrap all of this stuff up together in terms of the clean growth innovation program okay so how do we hold it together what are we trying to get to at the end of joining our, our sessions well first of all i just sort of said we tune the sessions for you the smes the people on the cohort we make it applicable to you and we give you bite-sized chunks of knowledge to go away and do something so how do you go and do something well we use the innovation canvas methodology from innovate uk and basically it's a diagnostic to try and help Help you roadmap your innovation journey and you should come up with an idea it could be a new product idea or a process improvement idea or a new business model idea and what we do is we explore the opportunity in your marketplace and the impact to your business we explore what your idea is and then we explore well what is your capability to execute that idea and what help do you need and that help could be commercial help it could be grant funding it could be local supply chains it could be engineering support it could be research support so so there's a mix of things there and this is where we can either hand this over to partners in the region such as lowcase and other uh, uh, service providers within the LEP, or we can tie you into the universities in terms of potentially uh, knowledge transfer partnerships and have you working as a project together with your idea or innovation uh, with the university. And just to give you some examples of, of, of uh, uh, things that have gone forward in in terms of the university relationships it could be research it could be product development it could be new business models so there's a whole sort of range and gamut of outputs that come out of this so let's remind ourselves of the goal the goal is to have you join us for the bits in red to join a cohort in your region with like-minded smes to try and enlighten you work out what is possible what is most appropriate for your business and then give you enough insight to go forward and actually do something and actually then that's where the low case partnership can come in and support you in lots of different ways so the call to arms in all of this then is we're running the next uh, southern cohort if you like in a couple of weeks time those are the dates there i would uh, ask all of you uh, that's interested consider to uh, join in and uh, see what we've got to say 
Over back over to you, Moe. Excellent. Thank you very much indeed. And um, I think also there's uh, some stuff that's come up on a chat, which I'll leave leave you to to look at. I think one's about voltage management, which is beyond my pay grade. Okay. So great. So thank you very much, especially leading us through the art of the possible innovation, the support you can get. Okay, now to Locase and Gary Crook, CRDF Business Manager. Welcome, Gary. Uh, thanks very much, uh, Murray. And, and thank you, Ian, as well. That was uh, a, a really uh, great overview of, of the clean growth. And for me, it highlighted how appropriate clean growth, growth is for all organisations, be it big ones or small ones. It re there really is value and um, a, a worthwhile journey to be had by any business engaging in, in clean growth, be it profits or for the general good. So I'll follow everybody else and try to uh, share my screen and get a presentation up. Now, Locase is uh, a familiar name. Uh, we've been around for around about four years. Uh, so many of you would have known about us, but we'll give you a quick refresh. And I'm conscious that uh, the clock is against us a bit now, so I'll be as, as punchy as possible. But uh, Low Case has been operating for three years. We're uh, for four years. We're hoping uh, to have uh, a further three-year extension, which is uh, literally to be signed off shortly. So uh, watch this space for details. But we're expecting to have uh, another three-year uh, run at supporting local businesses. Um, in this very short presentation, I'll give you a, a quick reminder of what Low Case is and does, and I'll give you some examples of some local businesses that we've engaged with and, and how we've done that. So what is low case? Uh, low case, low carbon across the southeast. Uh, we are a business uh, uh, support program. So many of us, uh, many people think of us as, as purely a grants support program, but we do a number of, of, of aspects of support for local SMEs. Um, I say local. Uh, we only operate with businesses that are, are uh, have chief operations within the southeast lab. So that's Essex, East Sussex, Kent, uh, and the whole area down the southeast missing the, the, the London area. The reason that we operate by LEPS is each, each area has a, a, a specific support packages and uh, the best way to organise those support packages is using LEP coordination. So um, we have a, a number of routes uh, to support, uh, the first being our business energy advisors. Uh, the first route into the scheme is, is usually via an energy advisor and, and that person will uh, either via telephone or, or, or visit, engage with an organisation, have a look at how you operate, how look at uh, 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 where savings could be made in terms of energy savings or carbon savings, and then give you a roadmap of, of, of the way forward from there. It may be that we need to signpost you to uh, an academic organisation, maybe that we refer you to, to uh, 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 the, green, the green, green growth platform to, to uh, uh, to investigate uh, ways to reduce your carbon emissions, or it may be that we can help you uh, with a project and give you funding to, to uh, you know, reduce your carbon emissions with direct uh, uh, funding via a grant. We can't do this on our own, so we use uh, a number of uh, delivery partners, uh, Kent County Council being uh, the accountable body for the programme. Uh, they also are the lead for uh, 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 what we call work package two, which is, is a distinct work package that supports businesses that operate in the low carbon economy. So you may not have a project that, that reduces your own carbon emissions, but by, by aspects of, of how you operate, you are generally doing good for, for the environment. So those businesses uh, uh, have a, a separate work package support program that allows them to, to develop. It may be in areas that are nothing to do with energy efficiency, maybe just to do with marketing or, or growing their, their organisation. But we, we realise that by supporting that low carbon economy, we are indirectly supporting uh, uh, clean growth and we are supporting the, the move in, in the, right, the right direction. Um, I work for Forex Council and we, we uh, look after uh, uh, Work Package 1, which is an energy efficiency work package. So these are the actual projects that, that deal with uh, reducing carbon emissions. So it's upgrading, upgrading of lighting, it's uh, uh, installing uh, uh, pieces of equipment that, that physically and actually reduce carbon emissions. Uh, the University of Brighton, who, who we've, we've heard from today, uh, 
or a work package lead on our knowledge transfer. So often we, we go into an organisation and it's um, it's um, it, it becomes you know obvious very quickly that that uh, they are on the brink of doing something really really interesting and really and really great, but they need the support and they need uh, very specific expertise that even our energy advisors can't offer. So in those instances, we, we uh, uh, engage our delivery partner in the Uni University of Brighton, who will then pick that up and have uh, a far better chance of, of, of filling that, that knowledge uh, gap or putting in place the, the expertise that, that, that's needed. Uh, other delivery partners uh, uh, include Essex um, County Council and East Sussex County Council. And of course, South End Borough Council. Uh, lots of our operations and lots of, of, of uh, our activity are based in South End, and South End seems to be um, uh, a hub of activity for us. Uh, in in the first um, six months of operation, I think it's been like eighty or ninety percent of, of the um, businesses that we engaged with came from South End. You were very quick out of the traps, uh, very eager to engage with us, and you've remained an area that that's been a, a leader as far as engaging with with clean growth is concerned. So what have we done for the last the last um, three years? Well, I'm, I'm happy to say that we've, we've uh, issued more than six and a half million pounds in grants to SMEs on our patch. And that is, is um, uh, money that is, is um, felt uh, straight on, on, on the bottom line of organisations. I know that, that uh, Ian previously mentioned about uh, the benefits of clean growth and uh, when it comes to cost savings, cost savings are, are, are more valuable than, than increased sales because they go directly to the bottom line. So any organisation that's, that's, that's managed to save themselves some money feels that benefit immediately in, in a big way and year after year. So uh, we're very happy to say that, that over £6.5 million pounds has, been, um, is, has been issued in, in France. Thousands of tonnes of, of CO2 has been saved and um, uh, we've, we've managed to help, uh, you know, over... You know, approaching this is a slightly old slide. Approaching one and a half thousand businesses have, have been helped. We create new jobs, and uh, the the ongoing the ongoing uh, economic benefits to to the organisations are, are are often uh, you know a, a critical thing that's felt. And in these times, you know, particularly with, with uh, the COVID situation, any financial benefit is is usually gratefully received. So. One of the, the main barriers to, to organisations or SMEs interacting with low cases, they don't think that, that it's appropriate for them. So uh, this is a quick list of the type of things that, that, that uh, you could be doing or you could be thinking about doing that we could help support you with. Uh, lighting systems is, is our absolute bread and butter. If you have lighting in your organisation and it's not LED lighting, then you could be saving money. And the return on investment for lighting projects is often around about a year and is certainly usually within two years. So that lighting installation will pay for itself in two years. So that's something that, that we uh, 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 will, will always be, be keen to, to engage with. And it's, it's an easy win as, as far as any energy efficiency program is concerned. Heating systems and cooling systems, generally through innovation and, and regulation in industries, the newer systems will have better performance of the older systems. So if you need to upgrade your, your, uh, your, your, your boiler, the latest boiler will, 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 will more than likely be more efficient than, than, than previous models. So we can help you do that. We can help you make the right decisions and get the best technology to help you reduce your carbon emissions. Refrigeration is, is another great area. A refrigerator of, of almost any kind from around about four years ago is half as efficient as the ones that are, are available today. So they've had to put extra pluses on, on all of the A's because the advances in, in the, the refrigerants used and how those refrigerants are pumped around the systems uh, always, always moves on. So if you have old refrigeration, you have the, the need to consolidate refrigeration, expand refrigeration. If we can get involved in that, we can help support it with design, but also with, with uh, uh, the all important grants to buy the right bits of kit. And the list goes on double glazing, uh, 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 specialised equipment is worth a mention because often our energy advisors don't ha haven't seen a piece of equipment before. We are, we are informed by the organisation of, of how a piece of equipment works. We then go and research and then help uh, 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 to make the decisions after. So uh, often we are we're, we're educated and we, we are given information from industry that, that we didn't previously uh, hear or know about before. Electric vehicles is a big one and is an, an increasing one. Uh, most organisations, most people 
uh, have electric vehicles on their radar now. Uh, the uptake is, is something that we uh, uh, really want to encourage and uh, we can support uh, the the, the uh, purchase of electric vehicles or the purchase of infrastructure that allows electric vehicles to become uh, viable in organisations. So if electric vehicles are something that you're thinking about, again, engage with us and, and we'll let you know how we can support that. Uh, software is, is uh, at the bottom of this, is, is a good one because it's, it's something that doesn't necessarily uh, immediately spring to mind as, as something that has anything to do with clean growth. But uh, clean growth is about uh, doing things more efficiently and doing things uh, using innovation and doing things that ultimately have a, a bigger impact on, on the environment. And software can often uh, fulfill that. It could be uh, software that controls uh, 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 an environmental system or, or a, a system that, that operates the, the, um, uh, the HVAC system within a building. Or it could be software that is used in a design process that eliminates a waste or, or energy usage during that design process. So it's an example of an abstract thing that, that um, uh, when you follow the chain does have a carbon saving. So to jump into to, uh, some of our, our, our local brands, and these are all brands that, that, that um, you would have um, seen before. Um, uh, Rossi Ice Cream has you know, been around for, for um, you know, since 1932. Um, the project here was, was um, a, a large project to do with um, uh, some specialised equipment and refrigeration. But the, the, the takeaway here is that the, the savings that, that they were able to achieve uh, with the project um, were 131,000 kilowatt hours and a saving on energy bills of 16,500 pounds. Now, there is no organisation on the planet that won't appreciate that kind of saving. And it's not just a saving for year one, that would be a saving for year two, three and, and for, forevermore. Once these changes in, uh, in infrastructure are put in place, then the benefits are felt year after year. Uh, so uh, it's it's um, uh, very pleasing to be able to uh, be involved in in, in um, such uh, leading local brands and to to help them achieve uh, such such massive savings. Uh, a second organisation, which is is um, um, uh, a, a new organisation, um, uh, and uh, the first brewery we've had in, in the area for for ages. That's Leon C Brewery. Um, this is a great example of a multifaceted uh, project where we did some lighting, uh, some specialised equipment that we hadn't seen before, some refrigeration, and it was all wrapped up into, into one package of, of support uh, led by the SME uh, that we were able to, to put in place. Uh, so it was, again, a, a, a very interesting project, a, a great organisation to be in, involved with and uh, a great example of, of how we can search out lots of different savings led by the SME to pull together a support package that, that was, was really useful. Um, an example that we often use, and one of my favourite organisations is Surgical Holdings, again, an organisation that you may have heard of uh, before. Um, this, this is a prime example of, 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 of an organisation that, that um, strives for, for, for excellence in, in what they do and is always pushing the boundary on, 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 um, on, on how to do things and how to do things better. Uh, if, whether it's uh, from um, uh, developing staff within their organisation, they, they have uh, apprentices that have gone right the way through to, to senior management, or whether it's winning awards uh, uh, from, from uh, low case or externally, they're always at the forefront of, of doing things, uh, uh, of doing things in an excellent way and, and pushing the boundary. We were very happy to, to help um, support uh, uh, Surgical Holdings um, uh, in developing uh, what they uh, uh, called a, a workshop, or what we would call a laboratory, uh, a, an area that, which they, they use to, uh, a very clean area that they use to refurbish endoscopes uh, to extend the life and, and to provide uh, a better, uh, faster, and, and cleaner service to, to local uh, uh, hospitals. So rather than having um, um, uh, machinery that is is uh, reached its end of life and it's, it's shipped off to to another country to be uh, uh, reconditioned and, and and replaced. They were able to to take this equipment locally and use very skilled e uh, experts to um, refashion it and, and 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 to bring it back into life. So we were very happy to be um, um, taken along that journey just to understand you know how that that business works, but in in a small way to support them developing that facility. Um, 
My last example of a local business, uh, I, I, was, I was hoping to show you a video uh, of, of the, the, the guys at Caddy's, which is a, a restaurant uh, with a golfing theme on, on, on South End High Street. Um, the, the video highlights just how fun they are and what a different organisation it is and how they, they see things and, and strive to do things differently. So it's it's um, the project itself was to help them uh, improve their, their uh, uh, air conditioning and their air handling systems. But the, the real reason that they're part of, uh, of, of examples is as a local business, uh, they are a, a, a striver of, of excellence. They're always looking for ways to do things differently and they're always looking for, for ways to, to improve. And if there was a common theme across all of these different industries and examples that, 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 that um, I, I've brought to you for, from Lowcase is that they are, they're fully engaged with, with clean growth which goes hand in hand with, with innovation. So what what um, your your find and, and what, what we see is that organisations that tend to engage with with clean growth are the same organisations that that do well and the same organisations that that prosper during difficult times because of their ethos of of searching to do things uh, in in a better way and constant innovation. So there, there are multi multiple reasons for for uh, engaging in clean growth, uh, but. There are definite uh, common traits that you see between organisations that do. So that's a whirlwind tour of, of, of um, uh, some of the organisations that, that, that we've helped in the past. Um, we are around to support uh, any organisation uh, uh, on in the South East LEP to, to reduce uh, their carbon emissions. We can do it in a multiple of ways. Uh, the first and, and the barrier and one of our hardest tasks is to engage with, with, with new SMEs. Uh, we have to go and, and search you out. So if you have heard of us then, then, um, and you do think it may be of interest to you, by all means, uh, get, in, get in touch uh, and we can have a, a, a very you know, informal conversation about how we might be able to help you in, in, in the future. Uh, these are our contact details. Uh, if you Google low case, we'll be number one, we'll be at the top there. So if there is any organisation out there that, that um, uh, does want to move forward or have a conversation, I encourage you to get in touch. Um, thank you very much. Over you too, Murray. Thank you, Gary. Thank you, Gary. Thank you very much indeed. Uh, clearly opportunities to build grant funding around. Um, what does, just so you, uh, everybody knows about the management of this meeting, we've got a slight overrun, but we are looking to take the questions being dealt with within the chat facility. And I think most are being dealt with. I think, uh, Gary, you may have a question from Paul Durrant, so please respond on that. And now delighted to uh, move on to Councillor Carol Mulroney, Cabinet Member responsible for Environment and Planning. Carol. Thank you very much. Murray. Um, good morning everyone and thank you for giving me the opportunity to tell you about what the council is doing and what it wants to do for the green agenda in South End, working with you to achieve a green borough. What speakers have shown this morning is how important it is to come together and to share knowledge and opportunities and it was very nice to hear Gary say that uh, the activity in South End is, is very very high. <clears throat> Last autumn, we joined a growing number of uh, local councils and declared a climate change emergency. Now over 90% of the British population live in areas that have made that declaration. But of course, fine words are not enough. They have just been the first step in acknowledging what we all know is the greatest challenge we face for the future and how we need to challenge ourselves to move forward, taking bold steps and positive action to tackle the future impacts of our changing climate. So we're not alone in this, and one of the best ways forward is, as we've seen this morning, to work together with other councils, environmental agencies, and yourselves to learn from best practice, be innovators, and set an example to others. I believe we are a special area, as are other coastal locations, with mega challenges, and climate change has the potential for threatening not just our borough, but our whole way of life. We are more at risk from the future impacts of climate change than the vast majority of urban areas in Britain. The declaration commits the council and those who sign up to it to a target date to reduce climate impacts locally, centred around commitments to become net zero carbon. In essence, where what we do has no net impact on the climate from greenhouse gas emissions. 
This means reducing as many carbon emissions as possible from buildings and then identifying appropriate, appropriate carbon removal solutions, such as carbon offsetting, which we've heard about this morning, to remove remaining greenhouse emissions. And we can't do it without you. So I'm asking you today, are you up for it? This is a huge undertaking to deliver across South End. And whilst the national target date for zero, net zero is 2050, we want to move faster. We aim for council activities and operations to achieve a target of 2030 and work with and provide support to businesses to help them do the same. We have already seen a 39% reduction in overall carbon emissions from transport, domestic and industry and commercial sectors in South End between 2005 and 18, primarily through a cleaner electricity mix based on gas and renewables as opposed to burning coal. Reducing fuel consumption and changes in transport emissions from fewer miles per head and more efficient vehicles. During the pandemic, we've all witnessed cleaner air, bluer skies, less noise. And although we must get the economy going again, we need to capture as much of that improvement as we can and stimulate growth that centres around a green recovery. So having sampled the benefits should give us the incentive to keep it up and change our ways. The graph on the next slide shows the reduction in the borough's carbon emissions between 2014 and 18. We're heading in the right direction, but a very high proportion of our emissions are in the domestic sector. The grey represents gas, the light blue uh, domestic electricity, so you can see the problem. But as a council, we can only achieve so much. We cannot do it alone. We, and I dare say you as local businesses, need to lead the way. We need to get the message across to domestic users and for whole communities to work together towards net zero carbon. If your business switched to LED lighting or improved heating controls, you'd saved energy. And if and improve your workspace, create better working conditions for your staff. And you can then encourage your staff to look at that sort of example in their home situation. Recently, the Borough Council achieved a 73% saving in our carbon emissions through our involvement in the government's carbon reduction commitment programme. It got us to report on our annual carbon emissions from qualifying buildings and demonstrated how financial and carbon savings go hand in hand. For business, the financial imperative is so important. So saving money and helping the environment at the same time has to be a good thing. We've worked with some of you through low case, as, as you've just seen, uh, to, to secure energy savings with grants of over £220,000 and funding to deliver exciting projects to build climate resilience across our urban landscape. We've done that together. How much more can we do? There's plenty of information available on our website. You can download our sustainability report for 2018-19. If you do nothing else after this meeting, do that. The next report will be out in March. We published the annual sustainability report highlighting our progress. And in August, we completed our first submission under the International Carbon Disclosure Project, which tracks progress on climate action and presents an excellent way forward for the council to do several things to discover new opportunities for emission reduction, demonstrate our support for national climate commitments, benchmark our climate action against other authorities, showcase our climate action ambition and progress. And working to see what other authorities do is very important. So what can you do? You all know about South End 2050, the vision, Actions to tackle the climate emergency are covered through the safe and well strand, but the green agenda permeates all of the strands of the vision. It gives us pride and joy. It makes us smart and connected. It gives us opportunity and prosperity, and it gets us active and involved. We aim to put South End on the pathway to become a green city and commit to delivering outstanding examples of energy efficient and carbon neutral buildings, green open spaces, streets, transport and recycling. Next year, we will publish three new strategies, net zero carbon, climate resilience and urban greening and waste, as well as a new local plan and the local transport plan. And our new tree policy is out on consultation at the moment. 
So please do take part in it and see how you can add to our tree landscape. These will show how we hope to achieve our aims of net zero carbon targets and building greater climate resilience across the borough. We will, of course, ensure that businesses are invited to take an active role in the consultation process for each of these new strategies and plans. We want to make sure that you play an active part in helping Southend to become a green city. Everything is interlinked, and that means working together, however small, however financially challenged we are, because that is what being a community is all about. Taking the knocks and bouncing back and doing better, and we can do it. But we can't just rest on our laurels. We need to look at all the other issues and consequences and consider how climate change will impact our town in all its facets and how we implement measures to reduce risks that include flooding, increased frequency of storms and more prolonged heat waves, and also issues like the consequences of COVID on working practices. We need to build greater climate resilience into our lives and work and adapt our green agenda to deal with and complement these issues. Thinking outside the box and being flexible and increasing and enhancing green spaces, which are not just desirable features or places for recreational activity. Carefully planned urban greening programmes bring enormous benefits. So climate resilience must be in at the start, not an afterthought. We are a very urban area and with the increasing pressure for more housing, which we need, this will eat up valuable scope for greening. We must be innovative and dedicated to building it into developments and developers need to play their part including provision for electric vehicles in their developments. A recent study in Denmark found that children in areas with the most restricted access to nature were up to 55% more likely to suffer from stress-related issues, depression and other mental health disorders than those in greener areas. And that affects everyone into the future, our health, our lifestyles, our business life and our finances. In terms of business, businesses, Consumers have a 12% higher willingness to pay for goods and services in retail areas that have green streetscapes or pocket parks. Small businesses say proximity to green space is one of the most important factors in selecting a new location. Whilst green space in and around an office has been shown to boost worker product productivity and reduce the amount of sick leave, we know it makes sense, so let's find ways to do it. The Borough Council wants to work with businesses to create a greener, healthier and climate resilient town. We will work with you and help you to realise opportunities to achieve your own net zero carbon targets or benefit from greener working environments. That is my key message today. Take it back to your managers and staff that we want to collaborate and support you and understand better what you might need from us. We want your input and expertise to help us count at the council and commu as communities to drive forward climate action throughout South End. How we can be more innovative with public space, embed climate considerations into policy and work with you to increase urban trees and biodiversity. And at the end of the day, just live together. We've all had the stuffing knocked out of us by COVID, but we're still in the game and we're ready to play. Soon we will publish our first Green City Action Plan with a strong emphasis on working with businesses to deliver our net zero carbon agenda. So please become actively involved in supporting our borough, cutting carbon and delivering a greener future for all of our residents, your businesses and our communities to enjoy with greener buildings inside and out, powered by clean energy with great open spaces. And finally, Let's not be too proud to learn from our children because they are leading the way. They're an open book to climate change, but we have the power to fulfill their futures. So let's make sure we write the best futuristic children's story ever. Let's make sure South End is the next BFG, the best for green. Thank you very much. Thank you, Carol, and uh, thank you for ending on a motivational uh, conclusion, because I think this is very important with everything around us at the present time. And um, there's a lot to be done, but uh, it, it is achievable. And, and thank you for that call to arms on that. So great. I'm very conscious overall um, that we did slightly overrun and uh, hence my uh, encouraging people to ask questions within the chat and for our presenters to respond. And I think in the 
99% of them have actually, some of the questions overlapped. But it, for those who are online and currently listening, feel free to follow up with our individual presenters or direct to me or to Caroline Reynolds, who are greatly thankful in enabling this meeting to, to happen. Uh, I think we had at one time about 50, 50 online from what, what, I, what I counted. So that was really great to see and thank you very much indeed. It just remains really for me to formally close the meeting with appreciation to our speakers. I suppose I should have a button that, you know, presses like, for the, you know, the football matches you see on TV, you get artificial applause, etc. But I think that would be a bit twee. But so, but appreciation to our speakers and appreciation to our audience. Thank you for being there. And as I say, please follow up with them. Look out for our monthly newsletters, um, South End Business Partnership. And again, there will be links to this about this presentation made again. So there hopefully will be a legacy that, you know, Carol's particularly talking about, we need to move things along uh, in order that we can grow a sustainable low carbon economy nationally, but also particularly down, down in South End. So um, I look forward hopefully to seeing you probably virtually again at our next briefing, which I think is still planned for the 26th of November. But once again, thank you very much for participating and I bring the meeting to a close. Thank you.